1988, you announced to the world you had found the uh, hepatitis C virus. Uh, but that discovery just didn't happen overnight, did it? No. Um, I started working on it in my laboratory in San Francisco in 1982. So it took six years. And that was our main focus in my lab. So we had many disappointments along the way, many failures. But eventually, um, we managed to succeed after six years. Did you have the idea, the uh, fixed idea from the time you started with the uh, studies that you were going to find an isolated virus? I felt that the molecular biology techniques that we had available at that time were able to discover the virus, but we were right at the extreme envelope of detection with those methods. But I did believe deep down that although it was going to be very difficult, I, I believed we would eventually do it. I understand you worked a lot using uh, chimpanzees uh, yes. samples mm. to get to that uh, discovery. Yes. The so the v I had a collaborator at the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Bradley, who was a chimpanzee expert and had spent many years passaging the virus in chimpanzees. So he was able to give us um, many, many samples, fresh samples from the chimp, which proved to be very important. And um, I had two collaborators where I worked in San Francisco, uh, Dr. Chu and Dr. Kuo, who were very important also in our discovery. So it was really a team effort for very many years that resulted in the identification of the virus. Why is the virus so difficult to cure, Dr. Houghton? It's a RNA virus which is highly mutable and highly heterogeneous. So it's not one virus, it's a huge collection of different RNA viruses. So that's immediately a problem. Um, the virus is flexible. You can hit it in one place and it will expand in another area, almost like a balloon. Um, and secondly, we, until recently, we don't have specific inhibitors of the virus. It was only six months ago that we came up with our first drug to specifically attack hepatitis C, which was the protease inhibitor. Prior to that, we had general antivirals, interferon, ribavirin, which don't target the virus specifically. They're generally antiviral against many different viruses. So now, thankfully, we've started the era of specific drugs targeting the virus. And I believe in a few years' time, we will be able to cure virtually every patient once we have these new drugs licensed. A lot of people do clear the virus, but after some time, they relapse. What exactly happened to those patients? Yes, um, during therapy, um, you can have three kinds of responses. You can have null responses where the virus is hardly affected. You can have a, um, a partial response where the viral titer goes down but never becomes negative. And then the third response is where the virus becomes negative and after cessation of therapy, the virus either stays away or relapses. In the relapses case, um, we don't really understand why that happens. We don't understand the molecular mechanism. We suspect it's because there are reservoirs of the virus other than the liver where the virus can hide and after cessation of therapy it can come out of that reservoir and then reinfect the liver. But we don't really understand that. It's a very important question. Was the HCV are really new virus, or had it been among us for a long time already? Um, from the phylogenetic analyses, where we can look at the sequence over many decades, we can then make predictions about when it originated. The predictions are rough, can't be very accurate, but I think we can be sure that this virus has been in the human community for many hundreds of years. The HCV? Yes. Some people do develop cirrhosis, uh, even uh, liver cancer and uh, liver failure. Others don't. Um, there is a percentage about 
30% of people do develop those uh, consequences and 70% uh, don't. Why does it happen? Yes. We know some of the factors responsible for development of severe disease. They are co-infection with other viruses like hepatitis B, HIV, alcohol consumption. If you are infected with hepatitis C and you drink a lot of alcohol, the disease is much worse. Um, obesity is a cofactor. If, if you're severely overweight and you have hep C, that produces more severe disease. So we know a lot about the cofactors for disease, but we don't know all of them. There are host genetics, there are mutations in genes that we don't know about in the host, in the human, that also, uh, along with the infection, lead to severe disease. So we don't understand fully all the factors associated with disease. When you discovered the hepatitis C virus, what was your personal perspective regarding the, uh, the way the world would fight the disease? Yes, yes. I thought that we would quickly produce blood tests to prevent transfusion-associated hepatitis C. And that is what happened. Uh, within a two to three years of our discovery, we were able to produce blood tests to protect the blood supply. I thought we would develop drugs faster than the time it eventually took. So it has been a, a slower than expected time for new drugs to develop. Also, I thought the vaccine would be easier. The vaccine has turned out to be difficult as well. So yes, I, I've been surprised how slow it has been to develop drugs and vaccines. Would you uh, be able to foresee back then, doctor, that 20 years after, there would be still in the world 170 million people suffering from the disease and most of them still undiagnosed? That is disappointing. Uh, I am disappointed that we haven't made a greater impact on the uh, number of infected people around the world. I think there are some reasons. Um, so in order to develop new drugs, you have to identify important proteins essential for the viral life cycle. One of them has been the protease of the virus. Now the protease turns out to have a very ill-defined structure. It's, it's a very difficult structure to design drugs to bind and inhibit its action. So that has been, that has been why it's been so slow to develop protease inhibitors. Fortunately, as of six months ago, we now have them. They have been approved for the first time. The polymerase inhibitors, another form of specific drug. We have good molecules that inhibit the virus, but unfortunately in clinical trials, they have been turned out to be toxic. We've had side effects, and so clinical programs were stopped. So it has been rather disappointing that we haven't been able to develop drugs faster. Most of people who got infected with yeah. hepatitis C, got it by blood transfusion. Yes. Once the government is the, the responsible for the supervision of the blood, wouldn't the government now uh, have to do something to inform the people who had the blood transfusion in the past yes. about the, the risk of being infected? I think it's very important now that all countries test the community for infection with hep hepatitis C. There are so many carriers that are not aware that they're infected. And every year that they go undiagnosed increases the chance of liver disease. So I think it's very important now that all countries test their, their populations for the presence of the virus, identify the carriers, and then treat them. We now have a new drug combination that can cure 70% of patients infected with genotype 1. And the old combination of drugs can cure 80% approximately of genotype 2 and 3. So we now need to be very active at identifying all the carriers in the country. And the government needs to play a very important role there. Today we know that the so-called baby boomers are the most in risk for having the disease. Why is it so, doctor? 
I think with the AIDS epidemic in the 80s, at, from that point onwards, people became aware of the dangers of blood. And indeed, hepatitis C is transmitted very efficiently through contaminated blood. Prior to the 80s, um, people were fairly oblivious to the risks of transmission from blood samples. Um, we didn't realize in the 60s that blood transfusion can result in transmission of hepatitis C, for example. And so there's a much better awareness now of the risks of blood um, transmis transmission. Um, in the 1960s, blood banks used to take volunteer blood donations and pay the donors. We've learned in the last 20, 30 years that that increases the rates of blood transmissible infection. Right. We've learned to rely on volunteer blood donors. So there's lots of reasons, I think, why um, the transmission was so rampant in the 60s and 70s. In other words, the baby boomer uh, generation. Yeah. In your opinion, would there be any effective um, action the world should take now to diagnose and to treat the 170 million people who suffer from the disease? I think more needs to be done. As you said, there are 180 million carriers of the virus worldwide. There are tens of millions of people suffering from severe liver disease from hepatitis C. There are more people dying now of hepatitis C than HIV. We need to be more active. Specifically, we need to test for the carriers. We need to screen the community to find who is infected. And then we need to be proactive in treating those individuals to prevent the development of liver disease. I understand you were also one of the co-finders of the hepatitis D, the Delta virus, the Delta. Yes, the, uh, the hepatitis D virus was discovered by Dr. Rosetto in Italy in 1977. But we didn't understand the nature of the genome of the virus. Uh, my group in San Francisco first identified the genome and showed that it was a very interesting molecule, very similar to what we find in plants, viruses that infect plants. It's very similar to the hepatitis D virus. Not only have you been the finder of the hepatitis C virus, but now you announced to the world that you have discovered a new vaccine to treat the disease. Yes, in my lab here at the University of Alberta, um, we've made a, what I think is a very important discovery, and that is in humans that we vaccinated with a particular vaccine that was developed at Novartis when I worked there a few years ago. We've discovered that that vaccine can produce antibodies that neutralize the infectivity of all the different viruses seen around the world. That's important because we were very worried that because of the high heterogeneity of the virus around the world, because of its high mutability and change, that a vaccine would be impossible. But now in my lab here, uh, and Dr. Law has performed this work in my laboratory, He's shown that there are conserved regions of the virus that produce antibodies that then work against all the different types of virus around the world. So it's a big step forward in the development of a vaccine, I believe. Does it mean that the vaccine may, be, may prove useful to other diseases as well, apart from hepatitis C? Well, with HIV, for example, it's been very difficult to produce those kinds of antibodies that inhibit the infectivity of all the different types of HIV around the world. Fortunately for hep C, it looks like it's possible. With other viruses, influenza, it's difficult to neutralize all of them. So I think we are perhaps lucky with hepatitis C that we're getting now the first evidence that we can have a broad vaccine that will work around the globe. We still have to prove that in efficacy testing, but I think our lab data is very encouraging that we can make a global vaccine against hepatitis C. Right. And how long do you think this is going to be until uh, the vaccine gets approved 
and gets used uh, to treat people. Yes. So far, only phase one clinical trials have been performed. Now we have added encouragement to perform phase two and phase three, and that normally takes around seven, seven to eight years. So I'm hopeful by 2020, we will have a vaccine available. Amen. <laughs> Dr. Houghton, on behalf of all of those lives you helped save, including mine, we'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.